Good morning to brothers and sisters. We want to thank God this morning that uh, we are alive and uh, we thank God for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ who is alive, who is with us, he is always God with us. And we want to thank God for that. Let us pray. Come, let us worship the God who lives in unity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, let us worship as a people who live in unity. How wonderful, how beautiful when brothers and sisters live together in unity, enjoying fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let us delight God today with our worship. Let us be united in spirit and in truth. Let us worship in spirit and in truth as we raise beautiful songs to God. And through our worship, may we be empowered to live as one body. Amen. I'm going to call Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God from the book of Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Morning everyone, really great to be here with you and it's just so awesome as Johnson said, Jesus is alive. Uh, we celebrate that this week and for the rest of the year. Uh, it's um, really amazing we can find many of the, the other prophets of other religions and everything, we can find their graves and where they're buried but Jesus, he's risen and can't be found anywhere because he's in heaven. So, uh, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be reading from Acts 4, 32, and I'll go all the way to 37. And it's about the believers share their possessions. All the believers were of one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerful, powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Wow, that's commitment, eh? Well, we'll get Johnson back and uh, get him to share his message for this week. I can't wait to hear what it's about. And uh, God bless you all. I'm back again. <clears throat> this morning I've decided to share with you on a theme, does... Easter make a difference? Does Easter make a difference? A bully in a small town resented the man everyone looked up to as the wisest man in the town. So he decided to teach the wise man a lesson. He held a chicken behind his back and asked the wise man, is the chicken dead or alive? Of course, if the wise man said, dead, the bully would show him a live chicken. If the wise man said alive, the bully would strangle the chicken and show up the wise man by producing a dead chicken. Well, said the impatient bully, is the chicken dead or alive? Let's hear your answer. At a much deeper level, that same question is asked of each of us on the first Sunday after Easter. Is Christ alive or dead? Let's hear your answer. Let's, last Sunday, Easter day, with an enthusiastic crowd in church, we heard a sermon about Christ's resurrection. In prayers and songs, we asserted that Jesus is alive. Today, a week later, we need to ask the question, for us, is Jesus alive or dead? The truth, of course, is what? That whether we believe it or not, Jesus is alive. He is alive. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is alive. Whether the living Christ makes a difference to us today is the question behind the question of the truth of the resurrection. 
Acts 4, verse 32 to 35 tells us that Christ's resurrection made all the difference in the world for the early disciples. The disciples, the resurrection difference could be seen and heard in the peace they felt, the power they experienced, and the purpose that drove their lives from that point on. Not that the resurrection difference was not to be found in the trouble free life. On the contrary, Stephen's faith in the resurrected Lord meant stones and death. Paul's faith in Christ's resurrection resulted in jail and according to the tradition, being run through by a sword. Peter's faith resulted in persecution and according to the tradition, being crucified upside down but because he said he was not worthy to be crucified in the position as his Lord. So the difference was not a trouble-free life, but a life with spiritual peace, power, and purpose. <clears throat> so the question raised by our text is, what difference does Christ's resurrection make for us today? The Easter message can be tested with two questions. Is it true? Does it make a difference? So the Easter message is true. That's the good news. But does it make a difference in our lives today? Does it make a difference in our lives today? According to Acts 4, the early followers of Jesus experienced spiritual peace, power, and purpose in their lives. So the resurrected Lord inspired them to testify about the res resurrection to many people. In addition, the risen Lord inspired them to care for the need of the other. How about you? Is Christ alive, dead today? Let's have an answer. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That is Acts 4, verse 33. When hearts were aflame with love, they also kindled with love for one another. This love manifests itself in giving. Thus, the early church believers experienced the reality of their common life in Christ by practicing a community of goods. Instead of selfishly holding on to personal possessions, they looked upon their property as belonging to all the fellowship. Whenever there was a need, they would sell lands and houses and bring the proceeds to the apostles for distribution. So it is important to see that they distributed whenever a need arose. So it was not an arbitrary equal of division to, at one particular time. F.W. Grant explains, there was therefore no general renunciation of personal title, but a love that knew no holding back from the need of another. So it was the instinct of us that had found their real possessions in that sphere into which Christ is risen. So they find that they belong to one another. Somewhat sarcastic, but sadly too often true is, F.E. Marsh, Smodern Para, one has said, in contrasting the early church with the Christianity of today, is it not a solemn thought that if the evangelist Luke were describing modern church today instead of primitive Christianity, you would have to vary the phraseology of Acts 4, verse 32 to 35, somewhat as follows. And the multitude of them that professed were of hard heart and stony soul. And if very one said that all the things which he possessed were his own, and they had all things in fashion, and with great power gave their witness to the attractions of this world, and great selfishness was upon them. And there were men among them that lacked love, for as many as were possess possessors of lands bought more, and sometimes gave a small part of their off for a public good. So their names were heralded in the newspapers. And distribution of praise was made to everyone according as he desired. There is mysterious power connected with lives that are utterly dedicated to the Lord. That is not quite constant that we read in verse 33. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were talking about what they have seen, what has happened. A great grace was upon them all. It seems that when God finds people who are willing to turn their possessions over to them, he gives their testimony a remarkable attractiveness and force. So men argue that this sharing of full goods was temporary phase life in the early church and was not intended to be an example to us. 
such reasoning only exposes our own spiritual poverty. If we had the power of Pentecost in our hands, we would have the fruits of Pentecost in our lives. That's what happens. If we have the power of Pentecost in us, what comes is the result of the fruits of Pentecost. It comes, it's natural. Ryan points out, this is not Christian community. The soul of property was quite voluntary. So the right of possession was not abolished. The community did not control the man until it had voluntarily been given to the apostles. So the distribution was not made equally, but according to the need. These are not communistic principles. This is Christian charity in its finest display. Christian charity. So the Holy Spirit had descended on the motley group of ex tax collectors, fishermen and nobodies, and given them spiritual power far beyond dreams. In our story, we read that they gave a testimony to the power of the risen Lord. What a difference the resurrection made for them. That same power of the Holy Spirit to witness for the risen Lord is just given to us in the Holy Spirit baptism of our faith. We receive that same power at our baptism. In spite of persecution, threats of death, the murder of their leaders, the early Christians kept on their mission. They were focused, bearing witness to the peace and power and purpose that comes to a person's life when Jesus Christ is named as Lord. 300 years later, the Roman Emperor became Christian when Roman Emperor Constantine was converted. When Jesus created his church, he promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. No human empire, no evil domain, no demonic kingdom can win the battle with God's people. No matter what the odds are, no matter how we can try it, you cannot win the battle with God's people. Because our God lives. When Christ was crucified, he cried out, it is finished. In other words, I've completed the purpose for which I was sent to the earth to do. So the followers of Christ picked up that same sense of purpose as they invaded enemy territory with the message, Christ is alive today. Christ is alive. Believe it for peace, power, and purpose in your life. Christ is alive. He is alive. And when Christ is alive, we can see the things that happens in a Christian. The apostles testified boldly to this truth and the difference it made in their lives. When Peter and John were arrested for healing a lame man in the temple, they were threatened and told to stop preaching and teaching about Jesus. In reply, they said, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. In Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. That's what I called bold purpose. The purpose in life of Christians is to witness for Christ, no matter what the opposition may be. The purpose in life is to glorify God, to witness, to give witness of what who is Christ in our lives. So whenever you are moving in town, whom you meet in the restaurants, wherever you are, you are supposed to witness about Christ. So when they prayed, Peter and John said, And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant your servants to speak your word with boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus, in 4x4 4 X, X 4 verse 29 and 30. That's what I call bold, purpose-driven prayer. No wonder the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of the God with boldness, in X4 4 verse 31. They had got inspired purpose, Dedicated the bold and goldly purpose shakes people up. It did not. It did then. It does today, even today. When the Holy Spirit fills people, something happens. Even the place where you are worshipping is no longer the same. You can feel the presence of God in the building that way you are worshipping. Wherever you are worshipping, you feel the presence of God. They were bold and they were in Christian community. They found strength in fellowship with other Christians. So our story begins with this words. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. One heart and soul. Christian community called Cornelia in the New Testament makes all the difference in the world. 
When Christians really come together with Christ in their midst, people will notice. They will see that these are Christians. When Christ is present in them, wherever you are walking, you may try to hide your identity, but people will notice that you are a Christian. You can't hide the cross of Christ. You can't hide the love of Christ. You can't hide the Holy Spirit in you. And that is true. So this early followers had the right idea, namely that our purpose in life is not to gain possession for ourselves, but to glorify God by giving sacrificially. They knew what it means. So the apparent failure was in fact a monumental example of one of the basic principles of the Lord, to put others before ourselves. So the early Christians bear witness to the principle, Jesus first. Number one in your life is Jesus first. Others second. And yourself third. <laughs> that Christ spelled joy. If we put Jesus first, J, others or yourself third, and that brings to the word joy. <laughs> you have joy if you put Jesus first. If you put others second, if you put yourself third, you have joy in your heart. There's always joy that comes out. So the early Christian testified to the resurrected Lord with boldness, in community, with joy. They all witnessed by their deeds of love for the needy. Like then, we are called to practice faith, active one, active in love, active faith, not just faith, but active faith. Evangelism and social ministry join hands in Christian men or women for whom Christ has risen, leads the way. Sharing of the peace, power and purpose they experienced, the early Christians made certain there was not a need person among them. There was not a need person among them in verse 34. So the compassion of the early Christians towards the need really made an impression on men outside who had never seen so few service put into action like that shown by the believers in the resurrection. So you can see when the question says, does Easter make a difference? You can see that, yes, it did make a difference to the early Christians. Compassion for the need was part of the way of life. The people called followers of the way. The early Christians saw us the way. They were followers of the way, and we are people of the way. Because they've shown us the way how to do things. So if we don't do what the early Christians did, it's of our own choice. It's our own choice. Not what the Bible tells us. So they shared with the need boldly. Although most of them were poor, they shared what they had. Although many of them were persecuted, they didn't get caught in the trap of self-pity. They reached out to those who were trapped in poverty or sickness. There was not a need person among them. I like that statement. There was not a need person among them. That's the bold spirit of the early Christians who faced danger in helping the need in their time. They shared boldly because they drew people from Christian community. These early Christians saw the church as a family of brothers and sisters with God as the father. No one of them had it all together, but together they had it all. Putting things together. That's why they stayed together. Sunday by Sunday, through word, sacrament, and fellowship, these early Christians of the risen Christ drew strength from one another. They saw their churches as a mission station from which to depart to witness and save. So when the church becomes a mission station, you find that you come here to be empowered so that you can go out with the word of God, witnessing and save the community. So the church was understood to be like a body. When one party had the body, suffered. And I could say to an ear, I have no need of you. Every part of the body depends on every other part because we are one body so the church was seen as the called out ones the chosen but they understood that they were blessed to be a blessing they withdraw from the world in order to return to the world of needy people with the spiritual power from the communion of the saints that is was their purpose that was their attitude in addition to sharing with the needy boldly and out of Christian community, the early Christians shared with the need out of joy. Out of joy. 
You know, when you help someone, you need to help the person out of joy. Not grumbling or complaining. It's better not to help if you complain. When you come to help people, help with joy. They understood that since Christ had done so much for them by overcoming sin, death, and the devil, that they wanted to joyfully pass on to others what they had received in abundance. So they were now passing on the joy of what Christ has done to them. We began the story of the bully with the wise men. The bully asked the question, is the chicken behind my bag dead or alive? He thought he had tricked the wise men because he believed he could fool him no matter how he answered. But as often the case, the bully gets trapped in his own trap. Well, said the bully, is the chicken dead or alive? Let's hear your answer. The wise man replied, that's up to you. <laughs> that's up to you today. To know whether Christ is alive or dead, that's up to you. But Christ is alive. It's up to you. You can make those decisions. I don't force you, but I'm telling you the truth. Christ is alive. If your God is dead, try mine. Mine is alive. He's living. Christ is living. God bless you. God encourage you, knowing that we are serving a resurrected Christ. Who, when he is alive in our lives, things happen. Things have a great thing started happening. The church will never die because Christ is alive. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. We want to thank God. Faithful God, we say thank you for the world that has given us. You made it a place of beauty and a place of wonder. We see your care for nature that reminds us of your promises to care for us. We see your power through nature that reminds us that you are alone a God. Faithful God, we say thank you that you have all made all people equal. It is our own human nature to treat others as less than ourselves. Yet you have shown us that we must treat others with respect. May we include both rich and poor. Receive your grace and that sets us free to be a community of faith without bounds. Faithful God, we thank you that you have given each of us a role to play. We have gifts and skills that we can save you and be saved so that we can be united family. We know that you have trusted us with these gifts as you have trusted us with giving the gift of grace and freedom to your world. To our teacher and guide, we give thank only in you, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, we'll take our offering wherever you are. All the details for making offering so easy are on the screen. So it's up to you. But I just want to urge you that be like the first Christians. I didn't finish up the other part. If I was going to go on verse 36 and 37, it tells us about a man called Barabbas, Joseph Barabbas, who sold his land and gave all that he had to the apostles so that the work of God is going to be used. So we can also be like Joseph. He was a son of encouragement. He did great things. So let us pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings to you. We just want to thank you, Father. We just want to thank you, Lord. We continue to thank you for this wonderful thing you've done to us. Bless these offerings, Lord Jesus Christ. Bless every one of us. Bless those who have managed to realize and consider giving you something today. Thank you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all, brothers and sisters. Hope you have enjoyed our service today.